Welcome to the Array Crew FYC panel for the 2022 Academy Awards. I'm Rebecca Sun, Senior Editor for Diversity and Inclusion at The Hollywood Reporter. Array Crew puts the lie to the excuse that it isn't possible to staff a diverse production crew. It's a database launched exactly one year ago by Ava DuVernay and an all-woman team of executives populated with below-the-line professionals who are ready to be hired with an emphasis on highlighting women and people from historically excluded backgrounds. And with this month's expansion to our neighbors to the north, film and TV projects across the United States and Canada now have access to a diverse array, you see what I did there, of mm -hmm. below the line talent. There are thousands of professionals to be found across more than 600 job titles in more than 450 departments. And if you're a below the line artisan who's at least 18 years old with at least one verifiable production credit, you can create a free profile on Array Crew that can be searched by studio executives, producers, and department heads. And hopefully with a lot of hard work and opportunity, uh, you can be where our panelists are sitting today. I'm very, very pleased to welcome this distinguished panel of Array Crew members and Academy Award nominees. So I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. We have costume designer Jenny Bevan, who this year is nominated for Cruella. Hair department head Carla Farmer, nominated for Coming to America. Composer Jermaine Franco, nominated for Encanto. And film editor Pamela Martin, nominated for King Richard. Welcome, ladies. Thank you again so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, in addition to discussing the specific work that landed you in this year's awards race, given our host array crew, I also wanted to weave a narrative about career opportunity in our conversation. So I figured by way of introducing ourselves, um, I, I might ask you to, you know, tell me a little bit about what you consider to be your big break into this industry and how it came about. Jenny, to start us off. Hello, I'm obviously the eldest here, but, um, and that's what's a wonderful thing I think about the industry is it's not ageist and obviously in costume design there's some quite elderly ones of us still out there working if we want to which is great well my first break I guess came in fact when I was three years old because my mother sent me to a rather um, esoteric dance class where I met a little boy who I became great friends with and the families became friends and to cut a long story short he became a commissioning editor on um, an English television program called the South Bank Show, commissioned a film from Merchant Ivory, got me involved with it. Uh, I ended up in India with Dame Peggy Ashcroft helping her with costumes and then because it was Merchant Ivory I helped on absolutely everything else, crowd collecting, um, props, costumes, um, and acting in it, which is not my natural, um, but there was no one else suitable in uh, Jodhpur, Rajasthan. And because of that became part of the Merchant Ivory family. And Ismail just simply put me to work on any um, project they had coming up. Uh, and that really was my break into film because before that I was a theater designer and really thought my destiny was in set design. I love creating the world of the, the sets, but then, Overnight, I became a costume designer. And I guess my second big break was George Miller <coughs> asking me to do Mad Max, which was so out of my comfort zone, it was kind of ridiculous. But we got through, and here I am in Australia doing a sort of follow-up film. So that's that's me. That's incredible. I love I love that the, the woman who has really put the visual stamp on, on Merchant Ivory, you know, the, the sort of Merchant Ivory canon, then turned around and did Mad Max, Fury Road, and got an Oscar for it. So <laughs> we will talk about that more later. Um, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, Pamela, what about you? Well, I went to, uh, I went to NYU film school in New York. And uh, when I got out of school, I was cutting everything and anything I could get my hands on. Um, honestly, the, the, you know, when you go to film, when I went to film school, then everyone wanted to be a writer and a director. And I tried that I directed a lot of short films. Um, and it really took one professor who kind of knocked, you know, got, sort of got through to me that editing might be the thing because I actually had landed my first editing job before my senior year of college. And I was cutting a, I actually just talked my way into a job where I went to interview for a paid internship and they described the job and it sounded very secretarial to me and I said I'm not interested in that I want to do I want to be a real filmmaker and he um 
the, produ the producer director said, looked at my resume and saw that I knew all this editing equipment. And coincidentally, their editor had recently left and they needed to get some sample reels together for the NEA and the NEH. And so he said, oh, you know these systems? And I said, yes, I do. And I wrote down the names of them. And he said, well, if you'd be willing to get paid as an intern, um, and try out editing. We could try it for a couple of weeks and see how it goes and get these sample reels together. And I and so I said, sure. And he said, you can start on Monday. And I ran back to the school, it was Friday. And I checked out the manuals for the machines because I did, I <laughs> actually was like, which ones were, were that? And I showed up to Monday and started editing. So by my senior year, I was going part-time to school and working as an editor. I ended up being an editor on the uh, PBS documentary series on Samuel Beckett. And um, I went back to school and was still trying to make my senior thesis project that I wrote. And my professor, who coincidentally I just had drinks with last week in New York, um, said to me, you know, it was like our, maybe our third meeting about the script. He said, are you sure? Do you really want to make this movie? And I said, you know, I, I don't really want to. I'm not really feeling it. And he said, you know, you're the only kid in the class who is actually working in the business already. Do you like editing? And I said, well, I love editing. I've always edited my own films. And he said, why don't you do that? Because you, I think you'll have the pick of the best projects. So I did that. And then from there, I had a former professor after I had graduated, recommended me to Ang Lee and Tim Squires when Ang Lee was making his first film. So I learned how to be an assistant editor. And then I would go on with Tim Squires as a sound editing uh, duo onto other films in between. And very quickly, I was editing features within you know, three, two, probably two, three years of graduating college. I always think it's so remarkable that some of your earliest professional credit, feature credits were editing dialogue in two languages. And I mean, I don't, do you speak Mandarin, Pamela? I do not, I do not. I have, uh, all I can say is I have an ear for languages and I, I did study French and Italian, but it, it didn't really matter. So when I was working on Ang's first film, you know, we were cutting on 35 millimeter film with tape and splicer, not digitally. So it's a lot harder to dialogue edit on that. But Ang would be in the edit room and he'd say, you know, I really want a, an angrier reading of this, for example, this line. And he'd go away and Tim would say, well, I'm going to go to lunch. Why don't you try that out? And so honestly, like you can read human emotion in the face and the way they, you know, say the line. So I would learn it phonetically right, what the line was and know where it is in the scene and and just listen for one that sounded angrier to me. And I, you know, put it in there and cut it so that it fit in, in their mouth. And when he came, when they come back from lunch, they'd play it. And if Ang didn't say anything, if he was just like, okay, then I knew it was fine, funny enough. And I, I have edited in, you know, Japanese and, I, you know, other languages where I'd have a transcript and I could always pick up, even in Japanese, there are French and English isms kind of sprinkled in there. So um, it's not as hard. I mean, Mandarin was, is probably the hardest one because I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> that is so incredible. But again, it, it really speaks to, that's probably helpful because a lot of the viewers are not necessarily going to know that language and to have that sort of, like you said, the, the human intuition of of body language and that's yeah of thing. I mean you could tell like when everyone started wearing masks in the pandemic I discovered that I had a really tough time even understanding people speaking English mm -hmm. and that so much of my comprehension has to do with facial uh expression and probably some lip reading too right so yeah. without with this it's very hard to read with this covered up but but without it you really see so much in people's emotion just on on their face yeah, that's true. Fascinating. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, let's let's go to Carla next. Carla, tell us a little bit about what you consider be, to be your big break. Well, my big break came when I was just had my my second child, my son, and I was introduced to this small community of African American hairstylists who were in the business, and I had just finished hair school, and there was this free kind of project going where they wanted people to do hair, makeup, the camera. I didn't know anything about the business and they were like, Carla, you should do this. And it was um, a woman by the name of Nandi Bo and she's um, she ended up being an AD and um, she did a film and Alfie Woodard was the star of it. And, um, and that was my first break into 
kind of saying, oh, I think this is something I would like to do. And then I met Mr. Ken Walker, rest in peace. He's not with us anymore, but he was a giant of a man and he was an amazing hairstylist and he took me under his wings. And I did this, there was this HBO show called Tales from the Crypt. And I don't know if you guys remember that, but it went union and I worked on it 30 days and I, I, I got into the union like my first project. And then from, the, from then, I met people like Irma Kent, Miss Julia Walker, and these people took me under their wings and just developed me and helped me and groomed me. And then I worked in the business for many years on television. I did small films, and I feel my big break was when I did Dolomite with Eddie Murphy, my friend Stacy Morris is his um, hairstylist slash barber, and she told them about me, and um, they hired me for that movie. And from there, Stacy and I were co-department heads, and then we were co-department heads on Coming to America. So that's kind of how that all happened. Isn't that incredible? I mean, Dolomite to Coming to America to an Academy Award nomination. So easy three steps right there. Um, I also just want to shout out, because I don't know how else to put this in there, that you did the hair for the uh, Brandy and Whitney Houston Cinderella, which is... I did. So, I did, you know, I did worked with royalty before. <laughs> I did Brandy's hair in that, yes. Incredible. Um, and then, Jermaine, you know, you've always been surrounded by music your whole life, but how did it uh, turn into a career in film scoring? So I graduated from Rice University, which is a music conservatory. And I was playing in lots of orchestras and writing for theater and uh, had my own group writing a lot of charts for a Latin jazz band. But I came to, I, to LA to study with a master musician named Luis Conte. And while I was working, you know, just many jobs doing gigs and I was actually, um, you know, just getting my myself rooted in LA. I wound up working at LA Theater Center, and I was in the Latino Initiative, and I was a music director for lots of plays and comedies, and I was always writing charts and had live musicians. And someone saw me doing that, asked me if I would score their film, which was. Uh, supported by Universal Hispanic Film Project. It's no longer, this program is in, in, in existence, but they would give different Latino filmmakers um, uh, everything they needed and they got to produce it on the lot. And so the post was done at Fox Film Studios and at Universal. So my very first film, I wrote and played all the whole you know, score and I was scoring it at the Fox scoring stage with Armin Steiner, who's one of the most um, amazing mixers in the film music history. And once I got done, I decided, wow, this is exciting. I love this. And because um, I'd always been performing, but then seeing becoming a storyteller on screen sort of just opened my eyes. And then I just started getting a lot of work doing television and, um, it wasn't my, you know, I'd say my big break uh, would be working underneath John, you know, or in, alongside John Powell, who was a friend of my brother's. And I asked him if I could, you know, learn from him. I worked on 35 features with him. The first one was um, Happy Feet with George Miller wow. and um, also uh, Italian Job, many animated features. And then eventually I was doing all my own work on like at four in the morning before I would go to work. And then I got asked to do Coco, which was, you know, Coco was a big, uh, you know, door opener for me. And I worked on that for four years. I wrote, you know, five of the six songs, produced them. I produced all the musicians in Mexico. And that one thing led to another. And from Coco came in Canto. It's so incredible, and I, I and I really hope that it gives a lot of hope to you know the other below the blind professionals who, who are watching this to see that how much of a ripple effect that a project or a relationship can make. One of the things I love about the composition of this panel is that you guys come from different each each of you comes from a different field in the industry, but I think across the industry you can sort of see there are there are trend lines and patterns. 
Um, you know, this is an industry that's obviously very much predicated on who you know. Um, and so the role of mentors or door openers becomes incredibly crucial, especially if you are coming from a background that's historically excluded or underrepresented in any way. And so, you know, each of you has, I, I've sort of picked up on that, you know, each of you has kind of talked about that element. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, you know, these, these crucial components, what was really needed, you know, in your career to, to in order to jumpstart it, you know, and, and I'm thinking mentorship is one of them, if you want to talk to me more about door openers or, or, or other components that, that really, really made a difference. I'm thinking about self-initiative, just the way that, you know, Pamela was talking about how she went in there and just said, yeah, I know all that equipment. Um, for me, it's the same thing. You know, I, my first film, they were saying, do you know Aztec music? And I'm like, yes, I know Aztec music. I've just done a, a whole piece for the Houston Ballet Folklorico, you know, and I just, just went on and I had actually done it, but, but I hadn't ever scored a film. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I connected with another film composer who helped me and I, you know, I got the Mac and I got all the software and then, you know, just being able to be resilient and you know self self initiative i called up somebody that i thought was would be a good mentor for me and then once i went into his studio i mean talk about technical i mean there is so much software and hardware involved with film scoring and i i was you know playing live in orchestras so i had to jump into that whole technical field and I loved it. It was it was kind of, you know, like, oh, sink or swim. But you just have to take those initiatives, learn it. If you don't know something, get someone who can teach you. And the other one is, you know, I call it my jumping off the cliff moment when I left this really steady job at John Powell's, which I could have continued for many years. I was never bored, always great projects, but I just wanted to go solo. So I did that and you know that takes some initiative to do that and you have to really believe in yourself that you know when things are rough and people aren't calling that you are doing the work you're creating a body of work and it's going to work out and you've got to have that self you know belief and positive attitude so that's my two cents I agree with that I mean I think um you know, that, that believing in yourself thing is a huge piece of the equation because I, I remember when I graduated from film school, I had a couple of films that did quite well and they traveled, they came to the DGA and they went to Paris and I was in Paris with all these young filmmakers who had graduated already. And there was a director in the graduate department who made one of my favorite student films and I won't name names, he's a working director. And we were all having drinks after and he said, so what are you gonna do now that you graduated? I said, well, I'm an, I'm, I'm an editor, I'm gonna be an editor. And he, he actually said, do you really think anyone's gonna let you do that? And it honestly had never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. And I just said, well, I'm doing it. You know, like I'm not hearing that. And, and that's a big, big part of it. And, and just, you know, knowing that you are good at what you do, which some, it takes some practice and some time to, to feel that very confident about that, but knowing that you're perfectly capable and you can go out to do it. And of course, like the mentor aspect of it is very important. Um, you know, Tim Squires, who I worked with on Ang Lee's first three movies, when I got my first offer to cut David O. Russell's first film, at the same time, like um, Jermaine, you were saying you had a cushy job. Like I was at the same time, I was offered an assistant job that would have paid me more money than I'd ever made. And then I'm being at like given, you know, this opportunity to cut my first feature on my own, but it was deferred pay and yeah, I could barely squeak by. And I, I talked to Tim and Tim said, if you can figure out a way to do the cutting job, always take the cutting job. And so he just was this person who was just supportive, who said like, you can you can do this and if you can figure out a way to survive without the money and then it's funny because they came back to me and said well how much do you need to pay your rent and your utilities and funny enough this is kind of date me but in those days i could live on 600 dollars a month so i said if i and they were like we'll give you 150 dollars a week and defer the rest and i went okay <laughs> You know so um yeah you need mentors and people who support you and give you good advice yeah i i agree with both these um intelligent women, I surrounded myself with people who I aspire to be. And I also um, 
always believed in myself. I had, I came from a family where they taught me I could do anything I put my mind to. And I have a huge faith in God. And those things I didn't understand, I knew that someone else was guiding, some other being was guiding me into this career. I just believe what these women are saying, you really have to believe in yourself. You have to know sometimes you're the only person that looks like you in the room and it's okay. Because I always felt I'm here for a reason and I'm capable of doing this job because I'm here. I would not be here if I couldn't do it. And I always, whenever I doubted myself, I said, no, I'm here because I can do this job. And, um, and I always contacted people while I was working. If I didn't know a period, I would call people and get their help. And I always surrounded myself also, I would bring my mentors to work with me. I would hire them and they would be part of the um, team. So those are things that I did to ensure that I was gonna give a great product. I feel I started in such a different field in theater, um, you know, and that was a very long time ago now. Um, but in film, I, I was very, very much guided by not only um, James Ivory, but also John Bright of Cosprop, who um, became my co-designer on the early Merchant Ivories, because he is just an inspiration on clothing, period clothing, a generous, wonderful man who's helped so many costume designers find their um, looks for particularly period movies. And he, he really is my, inspiration and what I try and do in my work is also encourage young people and, and with my one of my particular supervisors Claire Sprague we get as many trainees on as possible and Marcus Scotty we, we also um, bring on as many trainees as we can and then really try and look after them and if anyone talks to me about um, people they know young people who who want to get into the industry I always do try and talk to them and if possible, give them a chance. Because I think um, a belief in yourself is, is very important, but actually not everyone I think is um, suitable for the industry. I think you do need a certain kind of personality that A can cope with ridiculous hours, B can cope without um, having much of a family life. Although I have managed a daughter of whom I am phenomenally proud and is um, herself becoming a, a theater sorry, a film producer, and I will be working for her. Um, but, you know, it doesn't suit everyone what we do. And if it does suit us, it's absolutely brilliant. But you kind of have to have a go at it to, to see if it does work or not. And therefore, when, when you're a young student, so I, I'm involved with a couple of universities in London. I don't do nearly enough enough for them because I actually am lucky enough to work rather a lot and I kind of am keeping going at that while they're still asking me but um, <laughs> I think the whole mentor trainee um, uh, thing is extremely important and I bless John you know every day for um, general and he's still a wonderfully good friend and you know still running Cosprop um, so yeah it, it's it's a very important area. So wonderful. And thank you, um, ladies, for, for that insight. Now, I, I do want to be sure to uh, take some time to spotlight each of the work that's landed you in today's hot seat. And so, you know, I, I always find that, especially when I talk to artisans, that the, the, the more open the question, the better, because you guys are the experts in your field. You know, you, collectively, you have such an incredible filmography. But even so, I imagine that a good project always has the potential to yield some sort of new experience or a unique challenge that you never encountered before in your other work. And so I'd love to hear about at just even just one example from each of your nominated films that, that sort of really presented that for you. Um, and, and I'm happy to prompt you because I could easily lead a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of you about your work on just your, these one, these single movies. Um, but maybe, uh, Jenny, let's start with you ag again. I mean, first of all, for those who don't know, congratulations on your 11th career Academy Award nomination. Um, you already have two wins under your belt. Um, but Cruella, I, I don't, please correct me if I'm wrong, but is this the first time that you've designed for characters who themselves are fashion designers? I mean, th these are, those are the protagonists 
in this film. And so in other words, it really felt like the entire film literally revolves around the work of your department. And how did that affect you know, your storytelling? It's, it, it seems so meta in some ways. Well, it was a bit of a shock. I never thought I'd be doing Cruella because fashion is so not my thing. Um, but I guess that's also the wonderful thing about our world is we get offered projects and you think, oh, I could never do that. And then of course you can, because it's storytelling. It's, you know, it's storytelling about fashion designers in the 70s. And I remember the 70s first time round. So there was lots of fun bits of me and a funny Bieber hat I had, you know, popped in there. But um, in truth, that's what it is. It's a face off of fashion designers. First time I've ever done a film about fashion designers, but they both had wonderful stories. And we had Craig Gillespie directing and with a very clear vision. And of course the two wonderful Emmas um, playing, you know, the two designers having a ball, um, you know, sparring off each other. So that made it, um, pretty joyous. I mean, the problem with it was we only had 10 weeks to prep it. Although we got an extra six because Emma Stone, bless her, managed to hurt her shoulder and she was mortified, but I was so grateful it was ridiculous. And, um, and but we did it under considerable pressure. But in a way, I think sometimes stress suits me, sadly. I need a bit of, you know, oh my God, we can't do this. But actually, you know what? We can. We will approach it in bite-sized chunks, which is a very good attitude to life, whether you're clearing your sock drawer or designing Corella. So um, somehow or other, yeah, it, it was um, it was a new experience. But then that's again the joy of the job. Every film is different, even if you're doing two different Jane Austens. They're very different stories and, and written at different periods of her life. So they will be different. You won't just bring out the Jane Austen. Um, you know, uh, costume draw. Makes sense. Now, is there one particular look out of the 47 you designed for Cruella and the 33 that you designed for the Baroness that will sort of, if, if you had, that would like, if you had only pick one to put in your Hall of Fame archive, that was just your favorite or your proudest or presented the most unique challenge, you know? I think it's probably the one that a lot of people seem to like and it is the garbage dress. I mean, that was fun to do. It wasn't wildly stressful. It was, you know, but when we actually shot it at, I think, late at night on a freezing cold November night in central London, I was rather proud when it just worked, you know, and we did it in a couple of takes, I think. Um, and just watching it sort of float off down the road was, was, was a good moment. I will say that it was a really good moment. Garbage has never looked so heavenly. How long no, was that? Obviously. How long was that train? Oh, I, I'm not good at, de at detail. Or it was quite long. I think it was probably about fifty feet long. And luckily, we had a big workspace at Shepton Studios, so we could lay it out on the floor. And we did practice runs with it. Um, but it was supposed to be, and I'm not sure if it's still in the in the final edit. The Baroness's 1967 spring collection, hence the colours for it, and a lot of newspaper to sort of, which we actually printed on paper silk, because newspaper itself is a bit tricky to work with. Um, um, but, you know, it, it was a fun one. It wasn't That's too stressful, like the red petals, or, you know, just that was working out the weight and the whether she could walk in it and whether she could solution it around the floor. But, yeah, and we did we did do test runs before we asked Emma Stone to to do it. But um, yeah, I, well, I the, enjoyed that one. The the physics of it worked. It floated beautifully yeah. uh, down that street. Pamela, let's you know talk about uh, King Richard. This is your and also congratulations your second Oscar nomination. You know your first one was also for a sports movie, The Fighter. You're no stranger to sports movies. You're no stranger to tennis movies. Having edited Emma Stone in Battle of the Sexes, there's right. connections among everybody here. Um, I mean, tell us about some of the unique challenges that were presented um, by this film, though. It's, it, you know, these movies are not the same. Yeah, I mean, like Jenny said, none of, no movies, no two movies are the same. And yeah, they do present its own unique challenges. Um, I mean, I guess since you brought up sports films, since this is my third sports film, the unique challenge in the professional matches at the end of the film are that, uh, there were no, it was not, they were not live televised events. So there were no sportscasters. And in the other two films, The Fighter and Battle of the Sexes, 
sports casters were were a huge part of the of the shaping and the structure of those bouts or tennis matches the big match in uh, battle of the sexes um so i had to approach this one differently and i think it for me it's what made it interesting it was it was challenging because i knew i didn't have a tool that is uh typically used for cutting sports and ray was very much against uh, making a, an announcer voice. And that on, honestly, it would have been inauthentic anyway. Uh, the other films used archival sportscasters plus one cast to replace a, a real person. Um, so I had to cut that those that final match in, in particular as more of a approach it like a like an action sequence. And it also is an atypical sports ending movie because she doesn't win the match. <laughs> so that presents unique challenges as well. Like you have to be invested and you have to feel like there's hope, yet you have to feel how um, deeply emotional the losing was for Venus, her first loss really. And it has to be felt deeply enough so that the subsequent scenes at the end of the film pay off in an emotional way where you come around and realize, yes, she won anyway. So it, that, that final tennis match was by far the most challenging and music played a huge role. Our composer came on quite early and obviously I temp as we go with and sometimes I try to temp with music he's written for other films and you know sometimes not and so we had this little roadmap and we went back and forth and it just was one of those scenes that had to be calibrated emotionally so perfectly and so our sort of dance between music and picture was integral to making that scene work as well which is probably a good segue to <laughs> Jermaine. <laughs> That was a great scene, well cut and lots of tension. And I didn't, you know, know what was going to happen. It was great. And I, I do want to, you know, also say about Cruella, as I was watching that and I was thinking, wow, those dresses are so beautiful. And I just was thinking about my, you know, oh, what dress later <laughs> watch it again. I wish I could have her design my Car red carpet dress. I really did say that to myself before uh, this panel. I just, I just am so in awe. And Carla, you know, just your the work you've done. It's everything. I just this morning I, you know, re uh, visited all your work and and you too, Rebecca. I mean, everybody's just been down in the trenches doing this work. And it's so important because we're doing the work, but I think we are opening the doors for people who um, may not have these opportunities. We just done it and I, we didn't think about it. If somebody said, oh, you can't do that because you're, you're a female. I mean, I, it was more about, to me, just make music. And that's what I do. So on Encanto, my biggest challenge was how do I bring Columbia to this score, but I can't go to Columbia because of the pandemic. Um, so I had to immerse myself in Colombian music, um, which I did, you know, many, many thousands of hours listening, watching, reading literature in Spanish, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and finding that sound of magical realism in music, which didn't really exist as a film score before. Because you know you talk about temping and people, you know, oh, it could sound like this or that, but there was no temp music for magical realism. So I I had to find that through a lot of exploration. And one of the things I did was buy lots of Colombian instruments. I bought this harp. It's called arpañonera that they is specific to Colombia. I had a, a marimba made. Um, that's only made in Colombia and shipped to me. All these beautiful drums. Um, string instruments and I just surrounded myself in my studio with those instruments and I just played them and I sang and I played the piano and I was just digging for that sound and I found it with you know working with Byron and Jared uh, through exploration and the one most challenging scene for me was 
when Antonio gets his gift and he's opening the door, we wanted that to sound Afro-Colombiano, which is not a sound you hear in Hollywood. You know, the African slaves, they had their own communities that they escaped from the colonists in Palenque. And so we wanted to represent that and I just knew that had to have something to do with female voices. And so I kept, you know, working on the scene and using the instruments. And I just said, I've got to have singers from Colombia. And I managed to uh, get Carlos Vivas's, one of his singers in his band. He's an artist on the track. And I asked Disney, can we, can we do a session with via Zoom? with some Columbia singers and they said yes so I'm you know sending the track it took a long time because we're doing it all on zoom and uh, I had these 12 beautiful singers men and female male and female and this woman named Isa Mosquera who is Afro-Colombiana she sang her heart out and she was in tears when she finished because she'd never seen herself or this sound that is an amazing tradition of female singers and musicians. The whole band is all women and they're all uh, just chanting and work songs. And to me to have that in a Disney film was very special. And, you know, having such great musicians on this score, um, we recorded for four and a half weeks at the Fox scoring stage, which was the same stage I recorded my first film uh, for Universal Hispanic Film Project. So it was a very special uh, project for me and I'm so happy that um, people are loving it. I have chills hearing you describe that and the, the specificity, right, of, of, of all the textures that you put into that score. Um, it, it, it just makes it so, there's just so many layers there and there's such richness. So thank you, Jermaine, um, that's fascinating. And uh, Carla, now again, I just wanted to know, because we were talking about this before the recording, you also worked on King Richard. So, yeah. you know, you're responsible for recreating all of those looks that, you know, we saw in Venus and Serena growing up, but you're here to talk for, for coming to America. I don't want to restrict you though. Far <laughs> be it from me to restrict you from talking about all of the work you've done in the past year. But, um, you know, I am, I am very fascinated by, with, coming to America because you, you sort of had to create these looks for these two uh, fictional cultures, the Zamundans and the Nextorians. You know, how did you distinguish between them in, in the, the story that they tell with their hair um, and, and create these, these new cultures? Um, so just to tell us a little bit about what you found unique. Well, of course, Zamunda, we've already seen it. But in the first coming to America, we spent a short time in Zamunda. So I was excited reading the script, we were going to spend a lot of time in Zamunda this time, and we were going to see this other place called Nextoria. So described in the script, Nextoria was a lesser, it, they had lesser advantage, so they didn't have as much money. So at first it was presented, well, they should look kind of poor, they should be this, and I go, no, I said, let's think about it as more urban. I said, because a lot of times people who don't have as much resources, they create their own type of styles and looks. So we went with Nextoria with a more urban kind of sensibility. And that's why you will see Tiana Taylor who plays Wesley Snipes, um, daughter, you will see her in a different hairstyle each time you see her on the screen because I thought that rang true to an urban culture. And for um, Zamunda, we saw the first film and it was more based on a European type of sensibility with the older generation, but these younger kids grew up in Zamunda. So I felt they would be more influenced by the culture. So I grabbed a lot of references from the Afro-punk culture where they put the earrings and jewelry in their hair. And I just thought that it would be a little bit more elevated than Nextoria. So that's, those were my challenges. I had to really think about these things. So when you see the Nextoria, you would know it was different, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad, it wasn't, one wasn't better than the other. They were just different, you know? So those were the challenges I had to keep in mind when I created those looks. 
I will just never get tired of hearing about storytelling intention behind, you know, just the, the expertise of each of your fields. I mean, there's just so much there and just so much narrative, you know, that goes into these creations and these decisions. Um, I could also continue to talk about this forever, but uh, I, I wanted to also to note something, uh, you know, and talk about this a little bit. Jermaine, you are the first woman of color ever to be nominated in your category in the 94 year history of the Academy Awards. Um, and Carla, you and Stacy, your co-department head are the second two uh, black nominees in your category after Mia Neal and Jamika Wilson made history last year by being nominated and then winning for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And I just wanted to hear a little bit from both of you. I mean, I imagine there it's possibly even mixed feelings about being a first or being one of the few, but I just love to hear a little bit about your thoughts on this. Well, for me personally, I feel that the people before me, like I spoke about Mr. Ken Walker and Julia Walker and Irma Kent and all of these people, oh, Robert Stevenson, who did the first coming to America. These people were never recognized. So it makes me sad but at the same time, I know I am because they were, you know, I'm here because of them. And I personally know, I get really emotional they, talking about it because their work was never recognized. And because of them, I'm here, you know what I'm saying? So that's how I feel. I feel very privileged and honored that we are the second um, women of color being nominated and it's for um, it's like Ma Rainey was a different visual, and this is um, a visual of beautiful Black people, you know, and, and there are two different images. One is more artistic and one is um, more about beauty, and I just feel, I feel very proud of that part of it, too, that it's for beautiful Black images. That's what I'm really proud of. And you have so much to be proud of. Um, I think we're all proud to and happy and honored, you know, grateful to be nominated. I personally am. And um, as being, you know, the idea of being the first um, woman of color in this category, yes, after 94 years, you, you would think that um, there might have been other people before in this field. Um, I think one of the uh, issues is that it takes a lot and a whole community and a whole lot of education to grow a composer. Um, and so I, I look at that, but you know, there's women like Maria Grever, who is a very famous Mexican composer. There, there are other women before me that weren't like even um, Shirley Walker, who is not a woman of color, but she's a woman who was never nominated, who was an orchestrator. And she worked for Danny Elfman and Hans, and you know the women in the field just itself are you know out there. There are so many female composers who want to just be called composer because I don't think any one of us want to identify as a female this or a female that. I think we are that. We're that job. We're that that field. We're artists, and so I, it is sad that I'm the only the first, but I think what we're doing is opening the doors and leaving it. I always say I'm the first, but I'm not the last. And I will, I will do, you know, my due diligence to, to help. And I do this, I, I work in education um, with some music schools and universities to make sure of that. Because um, I think that, I think people are looking for new voices. And, and I've said, what if, what if only 2% of women wrote books? You know, that's because that's where we are in my field, two to 3%, what would we be reading? So I think women's, you know, uh, vision is important in our world and I'm just happy to be part of it and to be here, so thank you. You know, a perfect segue to, to the question I'd like to wrap with and, and opening it up to, to everybody. Um, you know, I'd like to know where in, in your respective fields, where are the current frontiers of inclusion? In other words, where would where do you think you could you would like to see the most um, immediate progress? And, and particularly how, you know, because I think each of you is now, you know, ascended to um, 
you know, a level of, of prestige, but also um, uh, in some ways authorities, right, as, a, as department heads. And so how do you use resources like array crew to, to make opportunity more equitable? for potential crew members, you know, to kind of to bring them up, right, and, and to build that pipeline. And each of you has spoken so movingly already about the, the way in which, you know, you were sort of able to be pulled, brought up and pulled up, you know, through your, throughout your career. So, you know, what do we need to do next? And, and, and what kinds of, how can we take advantage of resources to be able to, you know, make this industry um, fairer, more equitable, and to bring in so much more talent? I, I can speak to the editing uh, community, which is, um, you know, I'm a mentor in the ACE, uh, American Cinema Editors Diversity Committee, and the whole program, is, it was formed by Troy Takagi and Lillian Benson, who, you know, joined ACE, and Lillian, I think, was the first African American in it, if not maybe the second. But I know when I joined, when they called me up, to, you know, they asked me to join once and I didn't join because I was too busy raising my babies. And then the second time I decided to join. And when I went to be inducted in, 20 something people, I'm the only woman and everybody's white. And so um, luckily, you know, I, I was busy raising my kids and couldn't really take on more than working a full-time job and doing that. But now that they're a little older, um, I've gotten involved in that in the last four years or so. And it's an incredible opportunity to mentor young people, get them up into ACE. They, the younger ki the kids like mentor each other as well. They teach them what they know. People shadow me in my edit room or my assistants. And I think most importantly, hire diverse. You know, I've always had diverse edit rooms, maybe because th these are the people that I can relate to more. And I just think we have to just be supportive and help pull everybody up with us. Um, it, you know, it, and I think just in a, the bigger picture is, uh, it speaks to, you know, a little bit of what Jermaine said about the 2%. Like, these are, we live in a very, very diverse world and I want to hear those stories. And I think everybody who is from a marginal background or, uh, you know, whatever, they want to see their stories on the screen. And it's so important to, to, for them to see themselves reflected on the screen in a realistic way. And so, um, yeah, I think there's, the, there's also the African-American Steering Committee at the um, union, at the Editors Union at Guild. Um, there are lots of things and, and Array Crew is a great one as well. So I just think we all have to do our part to just pull everybody up with us and give them opportunities to, to you know, if you're able to, if you're an editor and you're able to give them a couple of scenes to cut and help just train people and get, get their careers going. Because we, you know, I came into this business, I didn't know anybody, nobody. Who, who did this for a living and my family's not in the business. And I just think, you know, imagine if, you know, uh, it worked out for me, right? Because <laughs> I, whatever, it, it's just partly luck, partly hard work, you know, but for a lot of people, they work really hard and they're good at it, but they just don't know the people and they just can't get their foot in the door. And, and we just have to be responsible and help them get there. I agree. I, I also hire diverse I also give people the chance they're like, you know, actors are vocalizing now more about what they need and what they value and that their skin color matters and their hair texture matters. So that helps. I also feel like I'm a, a African American hairstylist, but I hire people that look like me. And I also hire people that don't look like me because we all need to learn. And you can't be afraid to bring people that want to learn about your field that might not look like you. You know, you, you have to, everyone needs to be there to, we all have to come up together as Pamela said. And also I'm here, I'm on a show where the leads are all white and the actor wanted me here. And he's because I'm good at what I do. It's not because I can do black hair, I can do hair. So I'm here and my crew is diverse. So those kinds of things, we, we the, the allyship is important. You know what I'm saying? So um, I'm here because people believe in me 
and be, because I'm good at what I do as a whole. So I, ha I just have that to say mm -hmm. about that. I love that attitude, to be honest. Um, but, you know, we it's not because we're women or, or women of color, or in my case, of little color. Um, <laughs> it's, um, <clears throat> it is because we're, we are good at what we do. But therefore, we need to encourage young people um, so they all become good at what they do, whether they're black, white, brown, male, female, transgender, blah. Um, and um, I, I've always, always really felt that. So I think it's in England, uh, what we have at the moment is a problem of far too much work. Um, so people are actually doing stuff they really shouldn't probably be doing, but a lot will be learning and learning really well. Um, I think there's this whole thing of making products since the pandemic because people need stuff to watch. Um, but I think, I, I don't know quite how to do it yet, but because I'm still working full time in film, but my next goal, my daughter set up an extraordinary thing called read through in the pandemic, which was zooming. Um, a whole group of actor friends of hers to do Shakespeare set texts for, um, you know, the GCSE. Um, and that seemed to be brilliant. And she used amazing. She had a black female Othello who was out of sight. And then Harriet Walter, who is an older English actress, she wouldn't mind me saying this, as the Argo. And I thought that was just extraordinary. And they took it free to the state schools in England. And we're still working on, and that I think is the area, obviously that was a very specific thing, but I could try and help um, when I take a moment to breathe, because that's the area I would like to go into, but I haven't worked out how to do it yet, but to encourage people of all types to work in the film industry and say, actually, do you know what? It is possible. Probably need a driving license and ability to stay <laughs> ridiculously long hours, but other than that, um, give it a go. I agree. Um... I have worked in London at Air Studios and Abbey Road. And one of the things, wherever I go, whether it's in LA, London, I always want to you know, give the lists and see the lists of the musicians in the orchestra. And um, I always try and hire a, a, you know, a wide range of people, especially people of color and women, who are qualified and may not have been given a chance as a session musician, because the session scene is very tight and it's very difficult to break in. So I like to give, like for example, I have a cello player named um, Giovanna Clayton, and she's a Mexican cello player. It's amazing. She, you know, was never all ever given the chance to sit first. So I hire her, and she's my first chair. And she's amazing. And you know, I have Anthony Parnther, who's a, one of like two major black conductors. And on on Little, which is a film I did with Tina Gordon Chisholm, who's amazing, uh, writer director. Uh, that was sort of a funk and R and B score. And I literally went to a school in Compton. And I got an, a drum line because we had to recreate some um, African American or black drumming, and that's done in Atlanta. And I said, "There's no way we're going to get this groove with just the session players. We have to have black drummers." So I went, and there's a, a group called Children of Production. They play with all kinds of videos, other groups, and I went to the head of Universal Music, Mike Noblock, and said, "Mike." Here's the group. I know they're going to be able to do it. Can we hire them? We put them all on union contracts. I had a little girl who was in second grade playing drumming on that movie, and they all got paid union wages. And to me, that was a, a special moment because we are opening the doors that they might not have ever gotten a chance to be a session musician. And they were so important to that, getting that scene right, you know when Marseille's dancing in front of the school and there's a band behind her, you know, um, it was really great. So I do the same on Encanto and I, and I do feel like a Ray crew is really important for people looking for, you know, collaborators. And I, I'm gonna give a shout out to Sundance because I'm a Sundance fellow and Sundance is one of the places where I go and I'm in a lab, I find, I see 
uh, so many people of all nations working in those rooms and they've been doing such a great job and uh, there's so many organizations you know wanting to lift up and as like you said higher diverse higher not just who you think sh who you they can do it there's people who've been doing it forever and ever but having some i've had a few college graduates from ucla i take the chance because i think they're going to remember it and they're going to then the contractor will hear, will hear them and then they might be on the list later and one of the the violinists from coco um, on one of the songs she played in a mariachi band she was never hired as a musician and i pu put her in my section she's on so many sessions now Jermaine, that's the perfect, I mean, I, you can't ask for better evidence than that. I mean, what a difference that, especially that first credit can make, right, is in, in, in opening up the rest of your career, um, not just in gaining that onset experience, but because it's a chicken and egg thing, right? Like, it's, you, you can't get, you know, you, you can't get a job without having already had that job. And so um, it makes such a difference. And, and resources like Array Crew uh, make it easy to really find people with the right qualifications for, for what you need. So again, thank you so much to, to this panel. Um, congratulations on your Academy Award nominations. Thank you for your work, not only you know, in these films, but for all the work that you do in the industry, it truly makes a difference for everybody. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very it's been much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, guys.